Good morning. Um, I would like to welcome you to the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC um, first webinar in this series looking at uh, fire fuels and the science that underpins what we know. Um, this is the first of three of these webinars. Um, the next two are over Wednesdays in the next two weeks on um, May the 13th and May the 20th, 20th at the same time. It's great to welcome so many people. We've had an overwhelming interest in this um, seminar series with more than 700 people registered to attend with delegates from um, across all Australian states and territories, from New Zealand, across Europe, um, the USA, India and uh, America, um, Africa as well. So it's a very broad audience we're talking to today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Richard Thornton. I am the Ch Chief Executive Officer for the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the um, very broad lands on which we are meeting today, um, and particularly acknowledge the elders, uh, both the past, present and emerging, that may have joined us today. Um, why are we holding these events? Um, we originally had planned these events to be held as a face-to-face um, -a -face meeting back in early March to explore a number of issues, particularly um, to help the number of state inquiries and of course the, the uh, Royal Commission to get a better understanding of some of the issues and solutions in how do we manage the landscape for fire. But, and also to bring together leading scientists to determine the state of the science of prescribed burning. What is known, what is unknown, and what, do we, what is in dispute. So we hope that in the coming three, three webinars that you will find some people that you agree with and you will find some people that you completely disagree with. That's the opportunity to explore the points of where we disagree so that we can understand Firstly, where the, where the limits of our knowledge lie, but secondly, what are the things we need to work on in the future? Um, I'll just raise a, a couple of other documents and, and um, um, resources you may be interested in. Um, there's a new book about to be published through the Center of Excellence for Prescri Prescribed Burning, titled Prescribed Burning in um, Australasia, the Science, Practice and Politics of Burning. Keep your eyes peeled, that's about to be launched through AFAC very shortly and the Centre for Prescribed Burning. And secondly, in terms of timing, there's been a special edition of the International Journal of Wildland Fire recently um, published on adaptive prescribed burning in Australia for the early 21st century, the context, status and challenges. So anybody who wants to look at some of the underpinning signs, please go look there. I thank you all for your strong interest. Interaction in this, uh, this webinar is really important, so please type your questions in. And now I'll hand over to Gary Morgan, who will act as the MC for the presentation sessions of this webinar. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Richard. Uh, I'm very pleased to be the MC today. Um, today's live event is being recorded for later online access, and attendees will receive an email when the video is available on the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC website. The structure of this morning is that we'll have four speakers, each speaking for five minutes, and then we'll move to questions. As Richard mentioned, there's much interest today, and so how do you ask questions? Uh, attendees can ask at any time using the question and answer chat on the right hand side of your screen. Those you're looking at it now, it's the icon of the speech bubble with a question mark. Questions will be moderated and answered in the second half of the session. We expect that these topics will attract a lot of it questions, so we may not get through everyone today. So I encourage you to click like for questions already loaded, which are similar to what you may uh, wish to ask. The greater number of likes, the greater chance of being answered, particularly when we're covering 12 different countries. May I warn you not to click on your screen. If you do, it will pause the presentation. 
Now it's with uh, great pleasure that I introduce our first speaker today, Dr. Sarah Harris from the CFA. She is the Manager, Research and Development at the Country Fire Authority. She has 15 years experience in fire and climate science research. Prior to her role at the CFA, she held positions at Monash University, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and then the Victorian Department of Environment Sustainability. Her main areas of interest include the variability and change in fire weather, climate, wildfire lengths, and prediction of seasonal wildfire activity. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Gary. The talk I'll be giving today focuses on recent research related to fire season length and planned burn windows in the context of climate change. A quick acknowledgement to those who have contributed somehow to the research or given me permission to use their results and figures today. Next slide, please. A fire season can be determined by a range of factors and this can vary by jurisdiction. This makes it difficult to determine whether the fire season has changed in length. For the purpose of this presentation, I will focus on how fire weather has changed spatially and temporally and more specifically refer to fire weather as the fire weather index or the forest fire danger index. For some areas, the FFDI is not reflective of fire, acti fire activity and therefore the fire season. But in Southeast Australia, where I am located, there is a significant relationship between area burned, number of fires and the FFDI, as shown in figure two. In this presentation, I'll also cover research that has analysed the spatial and temporal changes in planned burn weather windows using agency defined thresholds. Next slide, please. There is global and national research on changes in fire season extent and length or timing. A study by Jolly and others in 2015 that analysed trends in global fire weather season length found that globally the fire weather season increased by almost 19% from 1979 to 2013. This is shown, the global trend is shown in figure three. Although there, are, there was large variability spatially in their findings. Closer to home, there have been a number of studies that have analysed how FFDI has changed over the last 50 years or so. Recently, Chris Lucas and I, using a high quality automatic weather station data set, showed that there has been an increase in FFDI across Australia, with the greatest change occurring in spring and summer, particularly in southeast of Australia. This is shown in figure four. The finding, this finding is supported by other recent research, such as the figure that I presented from the Bureau of Meteorology State of the Climate Report on my opening slide. This uses a different data set, a slightly different period, and revealed similar changes in FFDI across Australia and spatially. In an associated paper by Dowdy in 2018, he, he finds, I quote, a clear trend toward more dangerous conditions during spring and summer in southern Australia, including increased frequency and magnitude of extremes, as well as indicating an earlier start to the fire season. Further work by Andrew Dowdy and others in 2019 finds that more extreme conditions are projected to continue under climate change. Next slide, please. Taking a closer look at whether the fire season is lengthening for specific regions, we need some metric or threshold to identify changes in the start and end of a fire season. With guidance from fire agencies, we conducted a study using an arbitrary value of an FFDI greater than 25. We looked at how often FFDI greater than 25, average across Victoria for 10% of the area, occurred before the 1st of September for 1972 through to 2017. We found that before 2002, this happened five times in a 30 year period, but from 2002 onwards, so a 15 year period, the occurrence of an FFDI greater than 25 before the 1st of September occurred 10 times. However, when we conducted the same analyses for the end of the fire season, we did not find a significant change. Researchers at the Bureau of Meteorology have also been exploring lengthening fire seasons by state and bioregions. They identified the first day of the year from July with an FFDI greater than 25 for 1950 through to 2018 and found the fire season is clearly expanding with it now typically starting one to three months earlier and ending two to six weeks later, depending on the region. It depends how we define the fire season to identify the length, but for most areas we see an earlier start to the fire season in spring, but not as clear and strong evidence for an extension into autumn. Uh, next slide, please. 
The studies I've shown are focused on fire season length using thresholds for fire weather indices, but there are some studies that have analysed how prescribed burn windows have changed or are projected to change. A study that assessed climate change and prescribed burn, burning weather conditions in southeastern Australia by Hamish Clark and colleagues published in 2019 found a complex pattern of projected changes in days available for prescribed burning and that the evidence to support a decrease in days is weak. A recent study led by Tom Duff from Melbourne Uni analysed the spatial and temporal variability of planned burn windows in Victoria over the last 46 years using Victorian fire agency defined thresholds. We also looked at the number of days of actual completed burns for a 27 year period. We found that overall those prescriptions were, there were very few, overall there were very few days available to, to burn. Therefore, it's not surprising that as a result, we did not find a significant trend using any of these burn classes in either spring or autumn. However, when we analysed trends in completed burns, so the burns the agencies conducted, we found that in spring there was a substantial decrease in the window of burning over the last 27 years. This is shown in figure seven. Even with the decrease in the window of completed burns, the number of days in which completed burns took place remained stable meaning agencies are implementing the same amount of burns in a shorter period of time. We did not find any trends in autumn. In conclusion, our findings indicate that currently used thresholds of prescriptions may not provide a suitable indication of the conditions under which prescribed burns are able to be undertaken. Therefore, this makes it difficult to capture how these burn windows will change in the future under a changing climate. And just quickly on the last slide, in summary, there are a range of studying studies with varying results, but overwhelmingly showing trends towards more extreme fire weather, particularly in southeastern Australia, and an earlier start suggesting overall a longer fire season. What is less clear is how planned burn windows are changing and will change in the future. And this is an area that requires further research. Thanks. Thank you, Sasha. That was really wonderful. Um, She's explained about climate change and the seasonal indicators for fire weather, those three ones, the El Nino, Southern Oscillation, the Indian Ocean Dipole, and the Southern Annular Mode, uh, all contributing to the lengthening fire season. So thank you, Sasha. Uh, Sarah, I should say. Our, our next presenter is Sasha Rundle from the ABC Emergency Broadcasting. Sasha has headed up the emergency broadcasting at the ABC for the last four years overseeing the emergency broadcasting preparedness of ABC staff and stations around Australia. She has been a producer and a reporter, including on the ground coverage of the Queensland floods and Cyclone Yasi in 2011. Sasha has a unique perspective to give to us today in her role, and she works closely with emergency services across the country to ensure the community is prepared for natural hazards. Thank you, Sasha. Good morning. Thank you. First of all, when we talk about emergency broadcasting in the ABC, we talk about many, many different stations, many people right across Australia. If you go to the first slide, the first slide will show you the, uh, the nearly 60 radio stations the ABC uses for emergency broadcasting. We do that to help the community before, during and after an emergency event. While a hazard reduction, a planned burn may or may not result in emergency broadcasting, it's certainly something the ABC discusses and also hears um, from the, uh, the listeners, from the Australian community. If you go to the uh, next slide. When we look at the, I guess the, the community's opinions for controlled burns, the, the bad news is it's not a binary set of opinions. It is not simply we should or we should not conduct controlled burns. Unfortunately, it's far more complex. From looking at the uh, social media in particular around the uh, the hazard reductions, particularly from the last three to um, to five years, we can see some really passionate views. They, they are mainly gathered into three different groups. First of all, those people who are in favour. You can see some of the, the comments that the ABC has received from various communities right across Australia. First of all, 
there is a, a firm view from some people that hazard reductions will keep the people safe. The, the, the view is there'll be more bushfires and those fires will possibly impact more houses if we have fewer controlled burns. The, uh, the opinion is we want all controlled burns, not less of them. Also, there is great uh, community opinion about job cuts, about resources, and those resources specific to the, uh, the controlled burns. The, there are some particular communities, mainly the, the grazing communities, where there are firm beliefs that farmers should be able to do more burn offs and that the bushfires will run hotter if there hasn't been one. Next. Then we look at the opposing viewpoints. The, the range of views against the hazard reductions, the, the, main, the main ones include health implications. They're bad for our health. Asthma sufferers will really face the impact. The, the pollution caused by any bushfire, whether it's a controlled burn or not, that is clearly of great interest to the community. Some members of the community look at the beauty of their area. The fact that burning everything makes this area far less attractive. There are quite, sorry about the background noise, there are quite strong opinions that some are being uh, conducted on days when it's just not safe. There are quite some uh, strong views about animals, the, the amount of flora and fauna that could be um, damaged or killed through a bushfire or indeed through a hazard reduction. There are some particularly strong views where they relate arson to prescribe burns. Some of those opinions have come through right across the, um, the ABC websites and also the social media accounts I looked at. The, the other views, and we can uh, see that on the next slide. The other views, they're neither for nor against. The, I guess the overriding perspective is that people are incredibly passionate. The, you know, quite often we hear my view is better, my view is stronger, my view is smarter than your perspective. We see a lot of criticism of other people's views. We also, oh, and I, I know we're going to uh, be discussing it, we also hear about Indigenous fire practices and some opinions that those fire practices are far better. The, uh, the cutbacks again, as well as the red tape measures, you know, they they have certainly come to the fore, particularly in the last six months. There have been quite a lot of community opinions about the cutbacks. The smaller window or the uh, for the burns, that is also something we're seeing far more often. The the argument about greenies, that is that is one we um, we can see from the, uh, the metropolitan audiences, but also from the regional audiences. Many people think it is or it isn't the fault of the greenies. There are firm, firm views in particular from some of the rural areas that we need more cattle grazing. We need them to be able to roam free in some areas, graze more by the, from the roadside or even in the uh, high country. And some councils think they should control the burns and some members of the public have shown that they agree with that perspective. If you go to the, uh, the next slide. It, it was quite interesting. Going into this process, having a they would have heard from more experts. If anything, the I season we're running up in land. Even then, we uh, could see there were quite about has in the bushfire. 
as in January, like most of the and I think that should have a season. If you go to the uh, the next slide, you can see why this is so important. For the people who are on this forum, you obviously have your own opinions. You will be making some quite difficult decisions and recommendations. But the reason your opinions are so important is because ultimately bush fires can cause great emergency events. They can lead to deaths, they can lead to destruction. The ABC certainly has seen a great increase in emergency broadcasting. We're expecting that to continue. So any of the work that you can do, we thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Unfortunately, we did have a bit of bandwidth problem there, and I apologise for those people who may not have heard everything Sasha had to say. Fortunately, we had the PowerPoints up and people could see the key points there. Uh, I'd have to say the ABC is firmly cemented as an important part of emergency management and fire management, and you did provide many of the various views that are being heard from the ABC. So thank you, Sasha. Our next speaker is Oliver Costello from Firesticks. Oliver is the CEO of the Firesticks Alliance Indigenous Corporation, which he founded in uh, 2009. From Barjalung country in the northern rivers of New South Wales, Oliver combines a broad range of experiences in Indigenous natural cultural resource management and Indigenous governance to empower communities, organisations, and stakeholders to develop a range of collaborative approaches to support Indigenous leadership and recognition of cultural practices through community mentorship on country. Thank you, Oliver. Oliver, please unmute your phone. I think I'm right now, sorry. Um Thanks, Gary, um, and good morning, everyone. I'd just firstly like to start by acknowledging country. I'm a um, Bunjalung man, so it's important to acknowledge my old people, but also all the ancestors and custodians across um, the lands and, and all the knowledge and practice that they've um, sustained in these landscapes and what it means for me, um, and I guess many of the practitioners that work in the space that I work in. So, um, Thanks for the opportunity to come along um, and speak. It's a bit odd talking to all these people you can't see, but I'll do my best. Um, so, you know, why is um, hazard reduction so difficult and divisive? And I think it's, you know, it's it's one of those things where if you look back at some of those comments from Sasha and Sarah, there's so much in this um, and we haven't even got into the, the burning practice side of it. Um, and there's so many different opinions. And I guess I'm here to share some of my opinions, you know, from a cultural perspective. So. I didn't grow up um, learning to burn um, like a lot of Aboriginal people through colonisation, displacement. A lot of our cultural practices have been suppressed or extinguished. But I was very lucky to sort of start to learn about cultural fire management about 15 years ago. And over the last 10 years, I've been very actively involved in um, <coughs> practising and learning and sharing knowledge around fire management. So I'm losing my voice too. <coughs> and so what I've learned over that time is that um, I think the, ho the focus on hazard reduction is one of the, the issues that, that concerns uh, me and many practitioners because when we talk about cultural fire management, we talk about fire um, as a part of looking after country. Um, it's a much more holistic understanding. We under you know, through that knowledge, we understand that all plants and animals, people and places have different fire relationships. Um, and there are natural and sort of cultural or, you know, um, human induced um, fire regimes. And so it's important responsibility of, of humans um, to be able to maintain fire regimes that are appropriate or the most appropriate fire regimes to maintain the health of that landscape. And through um, the, you know, settlement colonisation process, um, we've seen a, 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 a fracture um, or, you know, a, a discontinuation of a lot of those cultural fire regimes. We've seen a whole heap of other land management and uh, land use practices. And obviously, um, over time, that's um, led to quite different fire regimes. And what we've seen over the last um, fire season is, I think, more of what's to come. Um, because of the human-induced climate change, um, weather changes that um, Sarah went into, 
and because of the the land management and the fire management regimes that have been put in place over the last couple of hundred years, we've created this kind of situation where we've, we're going to have more um, extreme fire conditions and we've got extreme um, fuel loads and extreme and, and, and un inappropriate fire regimes. And I guess what I'd like to see is a better understanding around and a more nuanced conversation. When I was seeing uh, Sasha's for and against, I'm agreeing with with some of that. I'm, I'm seeing that, you know, like I think there needs to be more fire in these landscapes, but I also think that that fire needs to be appropriate. And some of the hazard reduction activities that, that I've witnessed um, actually are not appropriate fire. Um, they actually uh, at times can lead to significant environmental and cultural impacts. Um, they can also lead to more risk and that's the kind of nuanced conversation that hopefully we can start to have around planned or prescribed burning and particularly I guess from my perspective around you know more cultural fire management because cultural fire management is trying to achieve I guess that balance between those um, pros and cons around you know fire is always going to have an impact when you introduce fire into a system and so we need to look at what is the most appropriate um, application of fire to increase the benefits of that burning. Um, and when we talk about cultural fire management, we think that that, that sums up, I guess, the appropriate approach because it's about the culture of the land. It's about the, the, the values, the, the heritage, the natural, the environmental, the, the cultural, the social relationships. And together, um, we need to understand how do we apply that fire for the right culture of that land, the right you know, kinship of that land, um, because if we do that, we'll start to see healthier landscapes. And as we deal with, you know, fire risk, the, the, those ecosystems and those, you know, habitats and those places are going to be more resilient um, to impacts of fire. Um, and, uh, you know, fire is, can be a really positive uh, element. And some of these, um, you know, wildfires that we saw over this last fire season, some of those impacts were devastating and for me and many other Aboriginal people like horrifying to see our land our country devastated you know huge parts of Bundjalung country where I'm from the country that I know has really been heavily impacted and other areas that I've got relationships through projects just devastating but also when I walk through some of those landscapes I see some of the benefits of some of that that wildfire I see some areas that that under you know because of the previous fire regimes or because of the weather conditions or, or whatever on that day that the fire wasn't actually that bad and so we need to understand the nuances around the impacts of fire and we need to be able to better assess um, those impacts and introduce and to maintain the appropriate fire regimes um, because there's a lot of healing that needs to happen to these landscapes and and we've got fire seasons to come and the the catastrophic impacts of this previous fire season i think are uh, creating, you know, a ticking time bomb for the next um, fire seasons to come because the response in some of these areas is going to lead to fuel accumulation and we're going to have weather um, systems coming through that are going to be primed for hot wildfires, you know, and the fuel is going to be back there in, you know, the next 5, 10, 15 years. So what are we going to do and how are we going to work together as a, you know, as a broader um, community, bringing everybody together, doesn't matter which way you, you think, you need to all start thinking in a, in a way that respects each other and starts to learn from each other and we can respond to these challenges ahead. Thank you very much, Oliver. Uh, your explanation about cultural fire management is certainly uh, very beneficial and the appropriate fire regimes, uh, looking after country and about seeing more fire in the environment so that we don't have the fire intensities of the wildfires that we saw in the last fire season. Our next speaker is Justin Leonard from CSIRO. Justin has over two decades of research experience in understanding of how bushfire risk to life and infrastructure can be managed. His research combines learnings from bushfire exposure experiments on buildings with post bushfire survey investigations and computer modelling of bushfire interactions with buildings. He led bushfire CRC research on buildings and plumbability for a decade and conducted impact surveys after major bushfires, including Canberra 2003 and the Black Saturday 2009 fires. He was awarded the 2015 Bushfire Building Professional of the Year by the Bushfire Building Council of Australia. Thank you, Justin. Oh, thank you very much, Gary. 
Um, so as Gary's highlighted, I guess my focus um, over my research career hasn't been specifically in understanding fuel management, but what it has done is focused almost solely on what it's like as a house or a community to experience a bushfire or a bushfire impact. And I guess I can offer that house perspective um, in terms of the, the balance or debate between local and broad landscape fuel management. Next slide, please. And I'd also like to add the, that the context of looking at how those houses and lives have been lost over his, the history of Australia also gives us an important context of what fire weather severity um, we need to frame our, uh, our approach when we use um, fire management as, uh, as a means to manage risk to people and property. I know that there's many objectives in fire management, but I often hear people debate and use um, life and property risk as, as a quite a preeminent reason for various types of fuel reduction. So this is a, a graph that more or less shows all of the loss um, across Australia from zero to 100% um, in terms of lives, um, which is in the uh, orange line, and uh, I, sorry, houses in the orange line and lives in the blue line. So um, what it actually shows is the, that our loss is heavily biased to the really extreme and code red days that, that, that we've experienced in Australia. So these are the, 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 the few but very acute events that really define the majority of our loss. So, 80% of our life and house losses actually occurred on days that have exceeded an FFDI of 75, so that's extreme and above. And well over 60% of our life and house losses actually occurred on days that have peaked into code red. So I guess if we're framing the problem of how to manage life risk and property risk, we need to think about fuel management and what, how it's going to influence how a day under those conditions play out. Uh, next slide, please. That, that same data, which is loaded into um, this graph, and sorry, it hasn't lined up properly at the end, but the last two categories are extreme and code red. And what they highlight is that predominantly the life loss context in the extreme in code red um, is focused around inside life loss occurring inside people's inside homes and also life loss um, proximal to the home. Uh, next slide, please. And if we look at that sort of urban interface scene context, um, the house is certainly exposed to radiant heat and flame reaching out of the bush and um, ember attacks that project out of the bush. And I guess those three things are heavily influenced by vegetation management and modification of vegetation in a local context, so the less than 500 metres from the house itself. Um, so I guess that, that that's a very strong um, premise for vegetation management close to a building. Um, but I guess the question is, um, what are the factors that really influence um, how you can influence risk to this house in the beyond the 500 metre context in the broad landscape? And I guess um, in trying to extract what, what can really happen in that broad landscape context, the, the two factors that really come out is can broad area burning influence the likelihood that a fire even turns up at the house? Um, so can it change the effectiveness of suppression in the broader landscape? Can we arrest the fire? Does the total extent of a fire influence by broad area burning? And then the other one is in, in certain landscapes and certain scenarios where we have really high fuel loads and really high slopes, extreme fire runs through very heavy fuels can induce, can bring on fire induced winds that then can disrupt an urban interface over quite a long length scale, even greater than 500 metres. So 
keep those two factors in mind. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this, all, this graph also shows um, the context of fatalities, um, all the fatalities we've had in recent fires, um, of the people that were caught outside near their homes. And what it highlights is that 80% of all the fatalities that occurred outside actually occurred within 500 metres of their own home, which is another premise around the question of vegetation management near a home and the fire intensity and behaviour near a home is just as important to a house loss context and people surviving in a house, but also life loss context um, for people that find themselves outside. Uh, next slide, please. So to round that out, um, I think it's really important to come back to these, these contexts and premises to really test the question about um, how much risk mitigation um, uh, will be influenced by fuel management and treatments and how they really unfold on the days that really define uh, Australia's life loss um, circumstances. And I guess, how can we effectively use these contexts to better inform our approaches to fuel management? I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Justin. Uh, you did explain about 80% uh, of house losses, particularly on days over across by a danger index of 75. And you've posed a number of questions there for land managers on how we could make an impact for you. Now is the opportunity for everybody else to ask questions and I just urge people to who wish to make a question to go to the right hand side to the speech bubble which has a question mark in it and type in your question. If you see one that's similar please hit like uh, so we get an idea of just uh, similar types of questions coming forward. To go through the questions, I'm going to hand back to John Bates. He is the research director at the Bushfire and Natural Hazards CRC, and he's been monitoring them as they've come in. We know that we have on online at the moment that approximately 450 people, uh, and they're from 12 different countries. So we try to give everybody as much opportunity as we can. So over to you. Thank you very much, John. Thanks, Gary, and thanks, everybody. Look, for the question and answer session, we, we're going to go uh, to each of the speakers by name, and also we've asked them to, if they can, to get through their answer in, in, a, in a short period of time so that we can get as many questions in as we can. And my first question, or well, the first question that's come through, and there were a group of them, uh, we'll start with, with a question to Sasha. The, there's a lot of, of people, a lot of views, different perspectives around that, a lot of different values that people have. And I guess the questions are coming along the lines of what do we do to need to, to change it? Because there's commentary there that the things that you put up are the fours, the against and the agnostics has been around for forever and they haven't changed. Is that a, what are you seeing? What's the ABC's views on that? And have you seen or are you seeing any change? Mm, look, first of all, I don't think the ABC has views as such on hazard reduction. We're, we're certainly interested in the community's views. What what we are seeing is that the passions web and then they start to, oh, obviously at the moment, we're all involved in COVID-19. We're also doing emergency broadcasting for COVID-19. At the moment, we're not seeing as many fierce comments from the young public in regards to hazard reductions or in regards to preparing any part of Australia for the next bushfire season conversation needs to be undertaken. Maybe it needs to be undertaken, not just by the ABC, but by the media and with the experts um, in a more cons more concerted effort. You know, certainly there is a, a, a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of confusion. You can see that simply by looking at the range of viewpoints. There does need to be a greater effort in informing the community how that actually happens. I, I'm not certain. But because it is quite difficult to to get the the attention of the public before the bushfire season, when the bushfires were underway, absolutely we could see the opinions just rising, rising, rising. You know, at the moment we're probably seeing more comments about hazard reductions, but 
still, if you uh, compare that to what's happening with COVID-19, I think yeah, there'd be far more um, far more comments about COVID-19. So it's trying to get the, the attention of the public in a concerted fashion at the right opportunity. Yeah. Thanks, Sasha. Um, Oliver, just looking to, to come back to some of the things you've talked about, you, you talked quite a lot about the values and how in, in cultural burden in Indigenous society, you protect the values, you acknowledge that there are some impacts of fire, but there are also some benefits of fire on the other side of it. What, how, how in your culture are those values like balanced up so that you come to a compromise that gives you the things that you're looking for, but accepts some things? Because across the conversation at the moment, there are lots of people who sit in a particular position. They might be looking after environment or land or, or assets. They want to protect their thing, but don't seem to care too much about the others. Your culture has been doing that for many, many centuries. How do you do it? Yeah, so thanks, John. It really comes down to local cultural authority. So under traditional governance, you know, like local custodians are the authorities in that landscape and they have different totemic and resource relationships to plants, animals and places. And so that's what guides the decision making, you know, like you're in a particular country type, you know, like gum tree country and there's all these plants and animals that are associated with that country for it being healthy in your you know in with your relationships and so different different people like so different individuals within families and cultural groups different cultural groups have different values and so that's why um it's so critical for that cultural authority to be recognized in those cultural values locally because what you see is when you practice that at a continental scale, you have thousands and thousands of decision makers making decisions based on local cultural values, based on their totemic relationships that are hundreds or thousands of years old in that place and resource relationships that are hundreds or thousands of years old in that place. And so they know when the system's not working properly because there's an impact. That animal's not there, that that plant's not there, that food resource is not there. There's, a, there's consequences for that. You can't practice that. You can't sing the song, tell the story, eat the food. You know, um, when everybody comes for that ceremony or that gathering and there's no food there, doesn't look real good. You know, and so a lot of the, these practices are, are, are reaffirming because, you know, by practicing these management techniques, you re are rewarded with the benefits. You know, in a, a modern economy, it's, you know, money. But in a traditional economy, it's really about being able to, you know, the abundance of those resources and 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 the exchange of that knowledge and, and those resources, which is what's critical. And, and this is where, you know, a lot of the, our knowledge systems, are, you know, this is where some of this knowledge is sort of being pushed um, to the front center because we've, we've gone, oh, let's go, you know, check out this place or, you know, go and tell, you know, story or hunt or gather and the place is sick, you can't get through there, the animals are not there, you know, there's a cultural site, you know, maybe it's an emu story site or a koala, Burubi site, and and it's just no way a koala or an emu, you know, they live in different country, but you know what I mean? Like they can't, they can't survive in that landscape. So how do you, how do you reconcile that? So we see these indicators, you know, I'm not surprised by these wildfires because you can drive for, you know, hundreds of, you know, even thousands of kilometres sometimes and just see sick country, just all this sick country that's just just waiting to, to burn the wrong way. So that's what we need to come back to is that, you know, local kind of authority decision making process being able to, you know, make those decisions. Everything has a place, um, but just because something is somewhere doesn't mean it belongs there. And um, and, and and this idea that, you know, we, we never had weeds until exotics came. It's not doesn't work like that. Natural systems have, you know, dominance, dominant species and, and, and a part of our fire law is about maintaining kinship and keeping things in their place. So they have a place and they respect the place of others. Thanks, Oliver. There's a series of questions that have come through looking at um, whether playing and there's certainly one international question around that. I guess to start with Justin, you know, is some of what you're talking about a failure of planning in what we're doing, where we're building and what we're doing, and and, and how does that contribute to what you're seeing? Um, I guess there's, there's always a tension between um, building something that's robust to a fire arrival and doing a certain amount of vegetation management or vegetation custodianship um, in proximity to that building. Um, 
And I guess there's always the question of planning, should we build in certain landscapes and certain landscape contexts? And are we creating a, a major, you know, fuel management overhead or challenge to, to make that safe? Um, I think they're all open questions and trade-offs that we have to really, really work out. But there's a few truths that, um, that pan out in every circumstance, and that is you can't do enough veg management to stop extensive um, ember attack and surface fire attack, um, but you can do enough veg management to moderate extreme fire impingement on a building, so fl direct flame body attack from a large fire front, and you can go a reasonable way in screening or reducing the radiant heat load on buildings, which gives you that sort of balance between effective building design and um, localised veg management, which is either through fire or other means. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Sarah. Sarah, when you looked at climate change and, and the impact on um, burn windows and the like, is there any comment you can make on the changing vegetation, the composition of the vegetation and fuel structure over that time and what we, what we might see looking forward? No, no, I haven't um, been able to, uh, analyze that yet and I think that that's a, a real key research gap that we have. We need to invest in I guess understanding that vegetation climate and fire dynamics to then be able to project into the future and I don't think we're going to prob pr properly forecast and predict how plant burn windows will change in the future without conducting that research. We're likely to start seeing species change and, and we've had areas that have had these severe burns uh, quite often in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. And so we're starting to, to observe that. And so how that, how I guess that will change even into the future and will we see more of that? I, um, I think that that's one of the key research gaps. Thanks, Sarah. The next question is for Oliver. Uh, Ollie, in, in South Australia and the APY lands, and this is a question that is broader as well, um, we've seen the impact of, of invasive weed species and others, uh, buffalo grass, for example, that, that really change the environment and, and are not part of history. How in your, in your land, in your culture, do you address those things where what you're now seeing is not part of history, but is part of a devolving world? Yeah, I can't speak specifically to the buffalo grass, but I'm aware of those issues out there. And I guess I sort of touched on it a bit earlier. Like, there's some of these, there's new problems. There's lots of new problems. Like, most of the landscapes that we're operating in are highly altered um, and we have to adapt. But I guess the knowledge systems are adaptive and that's where we need, you know, sometimes it takes time to transition to understand, okay, this is the the way we need to, to shift our management approach. Um, so it, it's really localised that, you know, but there are, you know, plenty of other examples um, where, you know, you see gamma grass or soteria grass and other sort of species that, you know, a lot of grass species are um, have positive fire relationships. They've come from other countries where they are fire prone or, you know, so it's not always easy to manage them. Um, but it, it, it's important that you start to understand that relationship and you start to see how do we, you know, it might be moving or changing some of our practice just to make sure that we're starting to, to you know, manage that um, that shift. And sometimes these shifts um, occur and you just have to get used to new species, um, but you still need to maintain um, your active management approach. Otherwise, you're going to start to see more cascading impacts, you know, and so it's it's just important that you, you know, you, and this is some of the stuff that Fire6 has been able to do is through our community mentorship is, is be able to exchange knowledge holders, you know, so we can bring people from different places so they can start to say, oh, this is how we dealt with this issue or we've got a similar problem and start to share knowledge around how to respond to those new new issues. And, you know, I think that's kind of why we exist really is to do with new, new problems. Unfortunately, we get stuck in the old ones all the time, but there's a lot of new challenges and that's where we should be focusing our energy. We've got solutions to a lot of old problems. Um, we should be, you know, using those solutions to old problems and spending our energy focusing on solutions to new problems. Yeah, thank you. So the next question comes, uh, looks looks at risk management. I, I guess it comes to to the concept of, of mitigation and those things that we do well in advance. So, so I might uh, go to Justin for this one to start with. Um, when we look at things often, we get 
the what we see is a lot of reaction to things. If the fire season is here, a fire has started, things are happening. How do we reframe things to, to talk about prevention? So it's what we do right from the very beginning so that we're not having conversations about the vegetation is too close or the house is not designed. Do you want to maybe talk through that one for us? Yeah, sure. So I kind of see that as a question around um, community adaptation and what does it really take to um, um, encourage a community into a, a mindset and a thinking about adaptation, um, which sort of puts them at the center of the the um, the challenge to you know main, build a house well, maintain it well, um, understand the house's relationship to its immediate landscape, be custodians of the immediate landscape, say within their property, but also have a role and an understanding of what the landscape um, is and how it's maintained beyond the back fence. So a community and a collective community view and really it only really comes together in an adaptive context or in a, and an adapted community context when all of those things are in place, understood and embraced. So huge opportunities for an Indigenous knowledge base and understanding and mindset, I think, applied to the urban interface, um, I think is absolutely key. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So that next question, I think I'll, I'll throw to Sarah. And one of the things we've talked about, and I'll, I'll come back to Ollie after that, we've talked about, um, or with Indigenous birding, a lot of it is about place-based things. And there's a comment in a question here that says, in New South Wales, they've got bushfire management committees that are meant to represent, represent local views and contribute to fire. In, in Victoria, in the work that you're doing, you know, do you get a sense that that is happening more than it has in the past? And if not, why is it not happening? This isn't an area I specifically work in, but I, absolutely I do think that that I've, I, I keep hearing more about this, that there's a lot of community engagement going on. So um, yeah, I, I would say the answer is yes, and, and it's increasing, um, but it's not something that I work on personally. Yeah, no worries, thank you. And Oliver, just to, to sort of come back to some questions that, or conversations you and I've had in the past, you know, when you've described to me what you're trying to achieve out of out of the burning that you do in your cultural world, um, it, it's a lot of it about place, knowing place and doing that. But, and I think there's, there's people in the audience that are trying to get a sense of what do we actually mean when we talk about cultural burning? When we go to inquiries that are going on at the moment and people say cultural burning is the solution to things, I think there's a lack of clarity over over what that actually means because there are many versions perhaps. Are you able to, to succinctly describe what cultural birding means and whether whether the concept of place-based birding, so it is people who live and know that environment are well placed to achieve an equivalent type of outcome? Yeah, so cultural burning to me is about, you know, like burning, un, you know, for the values of that or the culture of that land and the people's relationship. So the, the, the relationship story is so important because I think a lot of the um, hazard reduction, a lot of the other prescribed fire regimes are so, it's sort of a bit of a detachment between people's relationships to those places and those um, species, um, not always. Um, and cultural burning is much more about what is the relationship to this place? What is my responsibility? What authority do I have? And then in a practical sense, there's a lot of technique. And so it's about applying the fire that actually, you know, protects the canopy trees and, you know, burns the grass and increases, you know, the abundance of particular species. Um, whenever you're burning, you're reducing fuel, but that's not the principal reason why we burn. If you know, it's, it's about maintaining that kinship and that healthy country. Like fuel reduction is more of an outcome than the primary agenda. And that's where I think largely we've gone astray because of society, the modern society's risk relationship with the environment. And Justin was touching on it before around, you know, like from a cultural point of view, you know, like I know that we learn, you know, as a, you know, we learn to burn, you know, by learning how to light a fire and a campfire. And then, and then as that, you know, you build confidence as a young child, you learn more and more. And, and then suddenly you're burning around your home. And you, you know, and so it's, it takes years and years and years before you learn to the country you know, how to burn beyond your like camp. You know what I mean? And 99% mm -hmm. of Australians don't understand burning around their camp, let alone how do they burn beyond that. And so there's just, it's not just, I'm not saying the cultural burning is, you know, like the technique that's the panacea for bushfire problems, 
But I strongly believe the the cultural burning methodology, our way of understanding country and our relationships to each other and sense of place, values, purpose, is actually a solution to these broad issues because it's it starts to tackle climate change. It starts to go, okay, well, why is there climate change human induced climate change? Because people are disconnected. They're not looking after the the the, the country, you know, and that, you know, we've seen all, you know, all the causes of a lot of these, you know, factors are actually because of people's disconnection to place, to their cultural heritage, to their identity. So Cultural burning gives you a pathway to understand that. And if through cultural authority, we can share that knowledge with other Australians and they can work under that authority. Um, so there's a whole heap of opportunities for, and we have huge interest from landholders that want to learn this stuff. So I think that's where, you know, like being able to understand, and it's not just about me telling, oh, it's a, you know, cool burn mosaic. It's actually understanding that there's a relationship there and you need to respect the relationship to be able to understand it. And then you can participate in an active relationship. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so we're getting towards the end of the Q&A, so I might just go around to each of the panellists just for, for a quick final comment and we'll, we'll go in the order that we presented. So Sarah. Uh, I'd just say there's that growing body of evidence that climate change is playing a role in making seasons more severe and starting earlier, particularly in South East Australia. Um, I only mentioned a few studies, but there's plenty more to support this. But the science on how plant burn windows, especially bringing in those, those vegetation changes, uh, is much le less clear. We need more research. Thanks. Thank you. Sasha. Yes, look, we're obviously seeing that that increase in emergency broadcast events. Uh, I think it does need a, a whole of community approach. We have such strength in our communities um, during a uh, bush and also during the recovery period. The, the more we can draw on the community knowledge and strength in the before stage, you know, the, I think that is that is possibly where um, Australia could find some more answers. Thank you. Uh, Oliver. Oh, I think um, you're muted. <laughs> I'm on mute, sorry. I just want to thank everyone for the opportunity to come and share. I think it's so important that we learn from what's happened over the, these last few months, but decades and centuries. You know, like, I think this is a really important opportunity that we all have to start to collaborate more, start to think about how we manage our cultural landscapes in a way that actually respond to our needs um, beyond our own human needs. We have to be responding to the needs of the, the landscape which we live in um, and hopefully we, we can see that research, that investment, um, I think more community empowerment. I think we need to, to, to enable and empower local people, particularly I'd say Aboriginal custodians, but all local people to be active managers um, in their landscape and to be able to look after it and be custodians so that we can hopefully prevent future impacts um, of what are going to be coming fire seasons. Thanks Oliver. And Justin. Yeah, I, I really resonate with um, with what Oliver's saying, and and sort of my sort of research careers really pointed me to the to the pointy end of realizing that um, enabling bushfire adaptation at the at the interface um, is really the key focus, and sort of our approaches around um, regulation and um, are almost sort of steering us towards um, fearing fire rather than embracing and um, and being having a confidence to work with fire and understand it and adapt with it and I think we just need to reframe our thinking and focus on what steps we need to take towards this path to adaptation and to, to sort of you know activate the the army that is our broader community in um, in addressing this issue. Yeah. Thanks, Justin. And just to wrap up the Q&A before I pass back to Gary, there's, there's a lot of questions that have come through that they've all been published now. You can see them there. And some of them may, may well be better addressed in the second or third parts of our webinar series. I think you know, that all of these parts are interconnected. So I think um, if today's a, a, a starting point for us, I think next week will be even better. So Gary, back to you. Yeah, thanks, John. And thanks for managing those questions. And uh, sorry for those who we couldn't get answers uh, to all your questions, but as John mentioned, they're there and we'll be able to follow through. A, a recording, though, of this webinar will be available on the CRC website and the CRC YouTube channel shortly. So we will email all attendees and let them know. Just in summary, today sets the scene for next Wednesday. We heard about the difficulties of prescribed burning 
Dr. Sarah Harris, she explained about the meteorological indicators and their effects of the fire season and the evidence of climate change impacting on our natural environment. Sasha Rundle uh, highlighted the many and diverse comments from the public on prescribed burning and poses a lot of questions for us as to how, how do we deal with all those and get people on the side and work with communities. Oliver Costello described about the benefits of uh, cultural burning on country and the environmental benefits of prescribed burning responding to the need of the environment. Justin Leonard uh, put forward the factors influencing the effects or the impact of fire on buildings and about interface management to decrease risks and raises the question of where we should plan in the future for where we put our homes in the natural environment. Please email uh, through your comments uh, that you have about this webinar, your experience to office at bushfirenaturalhazardcrc.com.au. I wish to thank you as uh, listeners and watchers and all to all the presenters. Thank you to the CRC and to the Academy of Science. Thank you all for attending and look forward to seeing you next Wednesday on the 13th of May at 11am Australian Eastern Standard Time for the follow up from this one, which is about the science of hazard reduction. What do we know? What are the knowledge gaps? The presenters will be Dr. Neil Burrows, Professor Mike Clark, Associate Professor Tina Bell, Dr. Phil Zilstra, and Professor Mark Adams. So it should be a good lineup and we'll build on today's webinar. So thank you to everybody. Thank you to the CRC. Mm -hmm.